than patients, and particularly how patients respond to compounds. Some patients respond well, some patients don't respond, some patients have an adverse effect. So there's a huge area of uh, information and data that is required. And it's, as I said before, it's simply too big a problem for um, one entity and one uh, company to be able to tackle by themselves. And so we repeat this cycle where we have a lack of predictive biomarkers, we have insufficient pharmacovigilant tools, we have outdated clinical trial designs where it's now becoming so expensive to do clinical trial designs that some pharma companies are actually withdrawing from areas because it's simply not cost effective. And then this also impacts through into more social, more economic areas where um, our current approaches are not adapted to the tailored therapies that we are going to need if we are really going to exploit the development and personalized medicine that we're seeing. And at the bottom here, we also need a talented pool of people who are used to working across many different areas, a multidisciplinary approach and multidisciplinary training. So IMI actually also supports some projects, education and training projects as well. Some of the key concepts that underpin an IMI project, it's that the pharma companies collaborate with each other. They enter into an open collaboration where they share data and resource with each other to tackle these problems that I've, I've already mentioned. Not only do the companies come together to work um, together, they also work with external partners, as I've mentioned, academics, patient organizations, SMEs, the regulators. And under the umbrella of an IMI project, you get open collaboration in this truly public-private consortia, where you get data sharing, wide dissemination of results, and you get a true collaboration between the different sectors that we currently have. I mentioned previously um, the fact that um, IMI tries to tackle some of these challenges, not so much by um, developing new compounds per se, but its focus is really on developing new tools and new ways of working. Um, and it does this under the framework of our strategic research agenda. In the early days, let's see, there we go, the primary focus of the SRA was really on the early stages of uh, drug discovery and development, so very much focused on the uh, preclinical, early clinical testing. But we had a revision of the strategic research agenda in 2011, where you can see that actually the bottlenecks that are actually facing us in terms of getting new medicines to the market quicker actually extend beyond our basic understanding of disease. And it's actually the way that we um, get approval for drugs, we get the uh, licensing for drugs, and then we actually get the reimbursement from society for drugs as well. So we have many different bottlenecks, and within IMI we have projects that are trying to address each of these um, different stages. I want to very quickly explain how IMI works, because it's very easy to say that, oh, we get everybody, we bring them together, it's one big happy family, and we all do great science, and everything goes brilliantly, which it does, but it's slightly more, uh, it's not so straightforward. So under the terms, or in the framework of the strategic research agenda, it's the pharma companies that come together and agree where they want to work, where they want to um, share a resource. And they then work with the executive office, where um, I am based, in terms of going through a consultation process where we finalize the call text. We then launch the call text, and then we invite applications from consortia of the external partners, from the, the public consortia. And we invite them to submit an expression of interest. Um, what happens is that academics, SMEs, patient organizations come together, put together a proposal, submit it in response to what uh, the call text, and then this undergoes a process of independent review. Because at the, this first stage, we merge the winning consortium from the public with the FPA consortium, we're only able to take one of these projects forward, one of the applications. So the top-ranked application is, uh, is invited 
to merge with the FPA consortium to form a true public-private partnership. They then work on a full project proposal. We get governing board approval, and then we enter a very important uh, stage that is really key for making these projects work. And this is a negotiation stage between all of the partners. This is really important. It's sometimes difficult, it's sometimes fraught, but it sets out the, label, uh, the legal framework in which all of the partners will operate and contribute. And sometimes it takes a little bit of time, sometimes it's a little bit uh, fraught, as I said before, but it's probably one of the most important steps because when the project starts, you understand and you know what's expected of you, what your contribution will be and what the return will be. And we do that up front. And I think that's one of the strengths of how IMI works. If you talk to people who have actually been through the process, they may not agree with that, but it makes life easier for the five years of the, the project. And so when we launch the project, we end up with an organization like this. We have a group of pharma companies complemented with uh, some public partners, so SMEs, patient organizations, academia, hospitals, and regulators. And as I mentioned before, FPA companies bring their own investment, so they bring their own in-kind contribution to the project, and public money only goes to those external partners. It only goes to what we call the public partners. And as I mentioned as well, the negotiation is very important, and as part of that negotiation, one of the things we've learned is that it's key to address intellectual property issues up front, and these are dealt with within the negotiation process. Because we've heard of examples of other public-private partnerships where these problems aren't addressed and then somebody gets a really exciting result three years into the project. And then the project slows down because people are focused on who owns the intellectual property rather than how do we exploit that and actually improve the drug development process. So we have an IP policy. It's flexible and it tries to accommodate the interest of all stakeholders. And that's very important to remember. Within IMI, although you may have different economies of scale, every partner has the same rights and the same responsibilities, no matter whether they're an SME with three employees or a pharma company with 50,000 employees. And that's very important for making these projects work. So you've seen that I've explained it's not a straightforward um, process, but we make it work. And that's through the hard work of F everybody, the commission, uh, FPA, and the executive office, not to mention the individual projects. And to date, we have launched 40 um, projects uh, successfully. We have many more at various stages of gestation, but currently we have 40 up and running. These involve 594 academic and, uh, teams, 363 FPA teams, 109 SMEs, we have nine regulators involved in some of our projects. We have 18 patient organizations. And we have committed just under 1.2 billion of our total budget of uh, 2 billion. And in total, we have about 4,500 researchers working on our projects. So you begin to get a feel that these are big projects. They bring together many different stakeholders. And we need this sort of kind of economy of scale in order to be able to address some of the, the challenges that, um, that face the pharmaceutical industry. And what I'd like to now do is just very quickly run through just one or two examples from some of the projects. As I've shown, these are very big projects, and I can't do justice to one of our projects in 30 minutes, never mind all 40. But one of the things that we always worried and people had asked us in the past was, well, it's all well and good. You've got all this money. You've got all these people. You put them all together. Do they actually do anything? Or do they just generate lots of nice papers that, you know, people, it's good for their CV, but you don't actually change the way in which drugs are discovered and developed? Well, I'm pleased to report that already, even though our earliest projects are or in their fourth year, and I should explain that most of our projects last for five years. So even though the earliest ones have just gone past the, the halfway point and are now entered into their fourth year, we're begin, begin, beginning to see that the projects are delivering. So they're delivering robust, validated models that can be used as new tools in drug development. 
we're seeing the discovery of biomarkers um, that are predictive of clinical outcome, both in terms of safety and efficacy. Although the focus of the original IMI projects is very much on providing new tools and new ways of doing drug discovery and development, a lot of the key challenges that are faced are actually at a very basic scientific understanding. And because a lot of our projects address these issues, we're actually seeing um, the identification of potential new targets as well. We, some of our projects are trying to understand how to do um, clinical trials better. And by the sharing of data, and um, I'll use a little example later on, very briefly, we're actually seeing that we're generating information that may lead to the better design and process of clinical trials. A key issue or a key um, thing that you're, you're all aware of is the sheer amount of data that is generated at any one time. We have huge amounts of data that are generated within the public sector by SMEs, that are sitting in repositories, that's spread through many different stakeholders. And one of the challenges we all face is how do we actually get access to that data and bring it together, bring it into one place where you can actually begin to do a proper meta-analysis on this data. And quite a lot of our projects are putting in place platforms that will facilitate this improvement in data management and providing tools that will improve knowledge management as we go forward. And of course, our education and training programs are delivering um, new, new and better trained uh, research and development scientists. I now very briefly want to run through a couple of specific examples so you get an idea of the challenges that are faced and what the projects are trying to do. As I said before, I don't have time to go through all of them, but I just want to give you a flavour of what we're actually doing. So... EU Ames is working in the area of autism. Now, as most of you will be aware, the problem with a lot of CNS disorders is that it's not a single disease, it's a spectrum disorder. And so you may have some core symptoms or core clinical features, but you have a lot of other associated symptoms that may or may not be present. So when you're faced with something like ASD, its incidence is relative hi relatively high. It's one in 88 births. You have a much uh, stronger um, occurrence in males. Um, there's a strong genetic link with high penetrance, but we have no treatment for core symptoms. And um, we're only able to treat the edges. We don't really know what we're doing. Now, if you actually think about what we understand and what the problems are in the field, I, take, I took this slide from uh, the EUAMS project because they tried to explain the situation in 2012. Now, although we have many different people working in this area, they're usually small teams or small groups of people or small initiatives, and they're all trying to tackle different little points. But if you took an objective view of the field before 2012, there really is or was no major strategy defined within Europe. There was no major or concerted efforts in drug discovery. There was no preclinical network. There was no clinical trial network. There was no translational network. There was no regulatory strategy. There was late diagnosis and sometimes incomplete diagnosis. You have poor knowledge of the patient needs as the patient grows and gets older. And although there's a wide range of treatments, nobody's really sure whether these are efficacious or not. So in the face of this, society needs treatments, society needs new compounds, and new drugs that are actually going to be able to make the lives of patients better. But how do you actually start from this? And what's quite frightening about this slide is that you can take many serious chronic conditions that are affecting people and society, and you can put up a similar slide where you don't have the preclinical networks, you don't have the clinical networks, you don't have this focused approach. And so that is one of the things which EU AIMS is trying to do, it's trying to provide a platform that can bring the different uh, stakeholders and the different disciplines together in order to begin to make a start at addressing some of these. Now, at the end of five years, even EU aims do not say that they're going to address all of these, but this is the starting point. So what they have been doing is they have... Um, uh, 
set, uh, put together a large consortium and they're taking a multi-stranded uh, approach, so development of new assays, animal models, translational science and clinical research, to try and come up with a better base for new evidence-based uh, treatments. And that's everybody working together, the pharma companies and the public partners. And what they've been able to show so far is that um, they're making great strides in terms of the basic understanding. So they're doing a lot of genetic research. They're able to discover de novo mutations. One of the partners contributed to this publication that as a man ages, his, the de, de novo uh, mutations increase in his sperm. And this is related to increased uh, risk of um, autism and also schizophrenia. So again, these are things that may not just affect a single disorder, but it may actually affect other things as well. Um, they are working on new animal models and also new molecules in trying to understand the disease, and this is offering the hope that at eventually they may be able to develop new treatments for autism. And very importantly, they have been working with the regulators to try and build a framework in which they can actually come up with some guidance on how you go about developing um, how you would go about developing a new drug for autism from a regulatory point of view. As well, it's not just the basic science, it's about putting in place an infrastructure that allows you to react and allows you to speed up the rate at which you do drug development. And so they're putting in place a clinical uh, trial network. Um, I also mentioned here Combat, because they're doing the same thing, but they're working in the area of antimicrobial resistance. So you can see that different projects are putting in place the same tools but in different areas to try and address some of the key challenges that are faced. So, I don't have a lot of time, but I wanted to show that not only are individuals, um, individual companies and different stakeholders coming together to work together, we actually encourage our projects to work together. The New Meds project is working on schizophrenia and depression. The Pharmacog um, a project is working on Alzheimer's. And what they, um, one of the things they're trying to do is come up with better tools um, for which you can begin to measure uh, cognitive defects in, um, in patients. But one of the problems is, how do you translate between patients back into your animal model and into the basic research? So they have developed this novel touchscreen technology that they have validated both for schizophrenia and Alzheimer's. There's a little rat doing his test. Um, and it's, but what's important, it's been jointly tested, uh, jointly developed by the pharma companies, by Orion, Janssen, Lundbeck, Roche, Albert Lilly, and Pfizer, all working together, all trying to standardize this methodology so that you have better tools with which you can begin to understand the disease and from, your base, from the basis of understanding the disease better and the defects better, come up with better treatments. Um, what's also really exciting and interesting about this is that compared to the old methods, you can begin to see how you could translate a touchscreen technology between animals and humans. It's a bit more difficult to see how you would use some of the older methods, such as the swim test. And so these sorts of um, technologies actually facilitate the translation between uh, different species as well. So I just want to now very quickly run through my last few slides, just to give you a flavor of the different areas that we're working on. So we have a similar approach in asthma. So it's trying to understand the phenotypes of severe asthma better, to identify better biomarkers, so that you can actually treat the patient better and understand the disease better, but then actually determine whether your treatment is actually having an effect. And patients have a very important role within that project. The European Lead Factory is an area that's completely different. In this project, what we have is we have pharma companies sharing the compounds from their libraries. And we are, we are building within this project a platform. It's an industry quality level platform that will be available to public partners. So there will be... Over 300,000 compounds from industry. This will be complemented by 200,000 compounds from the project itself. And then what you will be able to do is that if you are eligible for IMI funding, if you can be an IMI beneficiary, 
you can apply with your target or your screen to this project and they will run the screen for you. And at the end of it, you will get a hit list of 50 um, hits from, from that screen. And the hope here is that this will actually speed up the discovery of new uh, compounds in different disease areas. I mentioned the importance of data management. Very briefly, we have electronic health records for clinical research and we have the European uh, Medical Information Framework. And this is about trying to exploit the data we already have. The clinical data that we have, um, which is with the, uh, the patient data we have, which is with the European um, uh, health records, but also trying to get a platform that enables you to link the, clinical, uh, the patient data with your clinical trial data, with your basic data. They have chosen, EMIF have chosen Alzheimer's and obesity to pilot this study. And finally, we have the European Patients Academy on Therapeutic and Innovation because patients are going to be a key part of future drug development. So it's very important that we empower them with the knowledge to be able to contribute to that process. And then we're all interested in facilitating collaboration. This is just one little slide that shows the papers that have been produced between different sites from our different projects across Europe. So we're beginning to see an effect that we know that people collaborate with each other, but with an IMI, what we're finding, we're finding bigger collaborations, we're finding more collaborations, and importantly, we are finding collaborations outside of people's sectors, so across discipline, and I think that's going to be very important for the future. So just to finish off, I think one of the important things that we have learnt, and I'm sure you will understand, when it comes to bringing different disciplines together and the different stakeholders together, we really do need a neutral platform. We need somewhere where all the partners will feel respected, their voice is heard. And we think that with an IMI, we have, it may not be ideal, it may not be perfect, but we have a platform that tries to uh, protect the rights of everybody, from the large pharma companies through to the, the academic and the patient organisation. It's very key that we also, particularly in healthcare, as we face these huge challenges, is that we um, promote the involvement of patients, regulators and payers, because they are going to have a big say in the future. We enable innovation via joint effort where singular approach has failed. And particularly for us, particularly in the pharmaceutical area, um, it's important that we're upfront and honest about IPR. Companies will not develop drugs if they don't have IP, and we need to deal with that straight away. So is IMI a success? Well, I think even after four years, it's still very early to say. But what we can say is that our projects are developing new models. They are setting new standards that have been published and taken up. But what's really important is that we are seeing them been implemented by industry, Industry is already beginning to change the way they research disease, the way they work. And there are many pressures on industry. Um, and IMI is, is facilitating them to change the way in which they can work as well. Um, and as well, we have the impact on regulatory guidelines. So these last two are very important. We change the way in which drugs are developed, and we also improve the regulatory environment in which they're developed. So is it success? I think it's a start, but we've a long way to go. I haven't had time to go through all of the projects in any sort of detail, I, as I mentioned, but you can find all of the information on the website. There are links to all 40 projects on our website. And if you have any questions, please ask me now, although I've been Irish, I've talked too much as always. Um, but if you're very shy and you're a bit scared of talking to me, you can always drop me an email. Okay? Thank you very much.